Uh, so, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and I thank uh, organizers for this invitation and I also would like to congratulate for, uh, you for definitely getting an extremely interesting conference. I'm just enjoying uh, the whole discussion. Uh, so, my input in this discussion, I think, would be uh, it is uh, coinciding with the conclusions of the previous speakers that, in fact, it's not just under the ground factors which are defining production. In the case of Russian gas, I would say that above ground factors are becoming more and more important, which was a great surprise both for the Russian gas industry and for the Russian authorities. So first of all, I would like to focus on the gas production in Russia, then on the market uh, requirements and on the Russian response to the new situation. Well, on the production side, that's what we have. Actually, production is not growing. It, it was strongly shot by the crisis and Russia in this respect was playing the role of swing supplier to Europe. Actually, it has absorbed all these decline in the demand and it suffered more than all the other suppliers. So it was decline on the European market inside Russia and it is the explanation of this sharp drop in production. Production slightly recovered, then there was additional small decline in 2012, so it's fluctuating approximately at the same level during the last five, six years. Um, but you see there are some significant uh, changes in the structure of this production with the share of independence, which was very tiny in the last decade, getting bigger and bigger, and now it's, uh, they are providing for one quarter of Russian gas production. So, of course, Gazprom is dominating production, but the share of independence is definitely increasing, and they are becoming more and more active. And, um, just a few words about changing institutional structure because uh, it's not just small uh, weak independence or oil companies for which gas business was just uh, uh, associated petroleum gas and nothing else. Now there are much stronger players coming to this market. It's Novatech which is becoming much stronger than it used to be, which is increasing its lobbying power. And it's definitely Rosneft, which has acquired uh, Itera, which was independent uh, supplier and which is now uh, announcing gas business as an important part of its portfolio and which has very ambitious plans. So, let's take a look at their plans. Gazprom's short-term production plan is quite weak, I would say. So it's stable production. Gazprom doesn't see the room to increase this production strongly. And it's not because of lack of resources. So you see here the main areas of uh, Gazprom's operations. They are vast, but it's because of the lack of the demand for this gas. <laughs> Gazprom simply doesn't see any need to produce more. It has this additional um, new resource base, which was put on stream in 2009-2010, actually during the crisis, which is Yamal Peninsula. Russia was talking about this new uh, resource base for more than 25 years. Uh, on plateau, uh, it is able to produce 130 uh, BCM per annum. So it's really huge f area. Uh, it's not one field, it's uh, three giant fields and a number of smaller satellite fields. Uh, but as you can see here, Gazprom assumes just minor volumes of this Yamal, new Yamal gas to be produced simply because they don't see where to send this gas. In the longer term, uh, as uh, uh, the production on the existing fields will decline, and actually this decline is already very fast, which is understandable. These fields, uh, Rengoy, Yamburg, Medvedia, they were put on stream in uh, early 70s, so it's more than 40 years of operation, it's a natural process. But here is this Yamal, 
uh, which will increase its input in production. And actually, as you can see, these areas, they are showing potential additional production. But it seems that there will be no demand for this additional gas, so Gazprom will have to constrain its production volumes. The same is with Stockmann. Yeah, the, the field was prepared and you know that consortium was formed in order to develop it, but the ch situation changed on the external markets. Uh, the project was targeted at, uh, at the United States, at the American market, and obviously with the shale revolution it became absolutely useless. And in Europe we also do not see additional demand for gas, so the project was postponed and we even don't know for, for how long it is postponed because it's not obvious whether in 2020 there will be demand for this gas. So we have to wait and see. So again, I'd like to stress it's not the problem of the resource base. It's not even the problem of investments because, you know, it is, it is very ridiculous, but all the investments in Yamal, they were fun, finalized during the first year of the crisis. So uh, they are done already. Uh, these are sunk costs and Russia is able to produce much more gas on Yamal if anybody will need this gas. Well, uh, there is another new area which is just under development. It is Eastern gas program uh, production in East Siberia, in these fields of uh, Kavikta and Chienda, in Sakhalin, uh, pipeline transportation to China, to Vladivostok, new LNG plant in Vladivostok, possibly new LNG uh, plant in Sakhalin. It's under discussion. There are several different projects. Uh, but uh, here, uh, again, everything is in limbo. So the resource base is there, though it's much more limited than in the Western Siberia. So you can see that in Sakhalin it's just 13 BCM, in uh, Eastern Siberia it's 25 BCM in Chiyan, then 35 BCM in Kavikta total, which means that actually Russian prepared resources, uh, resources prepared for export to China, they are not that large. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, well, there are some uh, minor volumes in Krasnoyarsk region, but uh, it's not that much export-oriented. So, uh, but here, even with this prepared resource base, uh, we do not know uh, whether the markets need them or uh, where to send them. Should this gas go to China or to Asia Pacific as LNG? It's still under discussion. There is no final clear vision how to develop these exports. And therefore, uh, except for uh, some production in Sakhalin and uh, exploration and production, uh, Gazprom is drilling and they made actually quite large new discoveries in South Kirinske field. Uh, but anyway, uh, it is all uh, suspended unless, uh, until they will understand how to use all this gas. Yeah? And this uh, Eastern Gas Program, it was adopted by the government, it was approved by the government in 2006, and I would not say that too much happened <laughs> during the last six years. So it's still under discussion, and there are different groups with different interests, they are fighting with each other, so it's a very complicated and sometimes very funny process. Well, independence, yeah, it was Gazprom. Now, a few words about independence. Uh, you can see here that they are, in fact, ready to increase their production considerably. Uh, they have prepared resource base, they have uh, desire to increase their production. So far, they are limited by the lack of access to the transportation capacities and lack of the markets. Um, and you can see that it's Novatec, first of all, the largest supplier already, and they can nearly double their production volumes. Uh, it is Rosneft, and actually it's Rosneft together with the Terra, and it looks like Rosneft decided really uh, to again get into the fight with Gazprom. Uh, so Rosneft started acquiring the other assets, well, you know about NKBP. Now it was recently announced that Rosneft is looking at Bashneft, so uh, probably these are not the last companies uh, <coughs> which will be eaten by this monster. Uh, and uh, 
Actually, the company's plans, which they announced at their investor days, uh, give in total approximately 250 BCM by 2020. We have very strong doubts that it will uh, happen, uh, simply for these institutional constraints and lack of the demand. Uh, this is our projection, uh, Energy Research Institute, uh, it's our projection of the uh, production volumes of independence, but anyway, I think it's useful to understand that uh, there is also this swing capacity that in case of uh, additional demand call, uh, they, uh, there is a possibility to increase production quite fast by the independence in Russia. So, as I mentioned already several times, uh, the problem is not on the production side, the problem is on the demand side. So, where are the markets? The markets are shrinking. There is no any market anymore for imported LNG in the uh, North America. Just forget about it. Actually, Situation in Europe is also quite disappointing. Uh, there is market niche, but uh, it is uh, really very tiny and it is associated with much, much stronger co competition than it used to be during the last 40 years. Uh, suppliers here, they are put uh, in the merit order uh, with the Cost, uh, supply cost uh, going up and actually the problem with the Russian uh, exports is that um, all our new projects, being Yamal or Stockman or East Siberian development, uh, they are associated with uh, enormous costs. These are greenfield projects, very technologically challenging, uh, very challenging geographical areas, remote locations, so uh, if you put together production and transportation costs and then add 30% of export duty on top of that, you get the price which is marginal on all the markets. And Russian being, whether Stockman uh, gas or Yamal gas uh, supplied through North Stream or Yamal gas supplied through th South Stream, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be probably the most expensive uh, supply uh, in the market. And it is an explanation why actually the volumes of uh, uh, CIS, which is Russian and Central Asian gas supplies to Europe uh, in our uh, outlook do not uh, increase considerably, simply because with the European weak demand and the number of the new suppliers competing for this market, Russian gas is being squeezed away from this market. We are not talking about uh, dropping exports, we are just talking about exports which do not increase. Well. And I would say that in the European uh, market, the situation is aggravated by many non-market or uh, hidden market um, factors. So I've mentioned uh, already increasing competition on the supply side, which is fundamental shift and which is absolutely natural with the market development. I've mentioned already weak demand, which I think is not that natural, but which is partially explained by these high gas prices when gas is simply not competitive in the power generation. And you know this absolutely stupid situation when coal is getting place of gas in many uh, power plants in Europe. Uh, but then we have to add also this changing pricing system, which was probably the most unpleasant uh, news for Russia during the last decade. Uh, and now spot volumes are providing for about 50% of total uh, gas supplies to the market. And more importantly, most of the European stakeholders decided that they want spot indexation, even if it's higher than uh, oil-linked uh, oil price. Nevertheless, uh, they want to move to this spot indexation. And well, another very unpleasant and unfavorable factor for Russia is this changing regulation with unbundling, which is completely contradicting to the whole Gazprom strategy on the external markets, going downstream, building supply chains and so on. 
and also this gas target model, which is quite unclear so far. We don't know for sure how it will work, but we understand with the move of all contracts from the national borders to the virtual hubs, something will happen with the contracts. It has to happen, but we don't know how it will be designed. Anyway, this transitional period seems to be quite difficult and painful, especially taking into account all these investigations which are um, initiated by the European Commission against Gazprom. So in terms of regulation, in terms of uh, antitrust regulation, um, I'm afraid we will face quite a painful period. Um, so European market, it's in stagnation, it's unfavorable and we do not expect any significant growth of Russian gas supplies there. Domestic market, amazingly, it is also in stagnation. And it's something which was not expected just five years ago when it was booming and demand, gas demand growth was like 4% per annum and everybody was talking about a gas deficit. But with the weak economy, yeah, we had 7 to 8% GDP percent of GDP growth rates. By that time, now we have hardly 3%. Uh, so with weak economy, with much higher gas prices, and you know that they have to reach uh, the level of uh, so-called equal profitability with the European market, so it's European price minus 30% export duty minus transportation costs. So uh, actually, uh, demand is stagnating or even going down in all the sectors. And even in our most optimistic scenario, we do not see any significant growth uh, in this market. In pessimistic scenario, actually, we could even talk about slight decline. So no room in the domestic market. And remember this picture with increasing production of independence. It means, again, increasing competition. So they will fight. They do fight already for customers. And, uh, you know, uh, independence and oil companies, they are proposing discount to the regulated price in order to get new customers. Um, so our only hopes are associated with Asia. Thanks God it is growing. Yeah, and you see that this growth, it is really, really very fast, especially if you compare this graph with a picture on Europe. But devil is in details, as always. It's not that good if you take a look at each country. So even China, which is supposed to be Klondike for gas, yeah, which is showing now uh, double-digit growth rates in gas consumption, actually, if you compare their projections on the demand side, and uh, if you take into account all the contracts which are signed already, you will see that China was quite successful in providing its own national energy security, and it has already contracted more than enough gas for the next decade. So there is no, there is actually excess of gas until 2020. Well, of course, we understand that maybe not all Central Asian gas that they've agreed to supply will be supplied in time. So there is some flexibility, but nevertheless, there is no market niche until 2025. And even in 2025, we see just uh, 40 billion cubic meters of gas uh, and uh, only by 2030 there is some additional room. But we understand that uh, there is also domestic shale production which can show itself post-2020. I have doubts that it will be working before that, but post-2020 it's possible. <coughs> and there is a huge number of LNG projects, I will show them later on, uh, which are actually uh, looking for home, seeking home, where to go. So uh, China looks like a good location for that. Japan and South Korea. Well, here the situation looks much better and you can see that the market niche is expanding. It's really large uh, due to the decline of supplies from Malaysia and Indonesia, so the contracts are expiring, they do need additional gas, but there is also one but. Um, see these red uh, areas? It is new contracts from the United States and Canada. 
And you know, it's amazing how fast they were. It took them just a year and a half actually to sign all these contracts. It is a really good lesson for the Russian negotiators who are discussing this for, for six years, yeah, like that, without any contract, just memorandums of understanding. So the niche, it is still large, but it's actually getting uh, smaller as the time is passing. So this window of opportunities, it is still open, but it can close if we will wait for additional six years, let's say. Well, and as I promised, LNG market, um, uh, we have now very tight market and there are just a couple of new project, new LNG projects coming on stream during the next uh, four or five years. So there was boom in 2008-2009, now we have plateau, but then it looks like uh, post-2017 we will have the next stage of this boom and a, a huge number of new LNG projects, first of all in Australia, uh, in North America and by 2020 there will be something from East Africa probably, they will come to the market. And the problem is how we all will share this market, how we will compete, who will be the winner here. And uh, the North American huge advantage, which is spot indexation in the contracts, uh, it's really huge threat for Russian LNG supplies in the East, uh, simply because uh, it is not the similar resource base to the Western Siberia, which was really very, very cheap, and Russia and Soviet Union by that time uh, could dampen the market without any problem. Now we are talking about really expensive resources, Chiyan, the Kavikta, uh, production costs are going to be much higher, several times higher, and then you have to add this incredible transportation distance. It is new projects, so you have to build them uh, and they're really extremely expensive. So just as an example, uh, this Eastern Pipeline, Siberian Power, it is called from uh, Kavikta to Vladivostok, uh, it, is, it will cost uh, $8.8 .8 million per one kilometer. Incredible. Okay. This is just one of the illustrations from our report, this Global and Russian Energy Outlook, uh, showing the supply curve. And uh, what I want to argue is that it looks like there is a lot of gas uh, available in the world which can be produced with the uh, cost below $4 per MBTU. So here Russia is really facing an absolutely different situation. As I said, it's not about uh, production volumes, it's about production costs. If we will be able to compete, if we will be able to control these costs, and not only costs, but also taxes, yeah, as I, I mentioned already, this 30% additional gap which goes to the state directly through the export duty, making us less competitive. So. Uh, the situation is really very, very different from what we used to see. And uh, with the market prices, actually, that's what we've got through our global gas model. And you see that uh, prices, at least until 2030, they seem to be stagnating or even declining. Here I'm showing average weighted prices, so it's average between contractual prices in long-term oil-linked contracts, which will expire, and spot prices, uh, which is also bad news for us. So it's limited export volumes, and it's stagnating or even decreasing prices. And assuming the huge role of gas for the, sta for the Russian state budget, uh, it's really a threat for the, for the country's economy. So what's the Russian response to this unpleasant uh, and disappointing situation? Uh, actually, Russian export strategy had several stages. First, as I said, it was just dampening and increasing volumes because the Soviet Union needed hard currency badly. Uh, then it started in 2002-2008 when the new team came. They started price maximization and volume growth strategy, which is amazing, which is possible only on the growing, on the booming market. 
but finally the crisis happened and now the strategy is again it's price maximization but in much more constrained situation when you have to negotiate with the customers how strong you have to decrease the price but still resisting to this decline as as much as possible and it looks like in the next in the coming decade it will be still this price maximization pro, uh, strategy uh, i understand that for many of the european customers it's a bad message because many people are expecting russia to review its strategy uh, but again it has uh, its own economic rationale maybe it's cynical but nevertheless i'll try to show how it works. Um, look at Europe, where new additional gas will come to Europe until 2018, 2020. Uh, what are the sources? Australia, forget about it. It's already contracted to the Asian market. Uh, North America, uh, East Africa, Mm, I'll show the next slide and you will understand uh, my point. Um, Algeria eh, can hardly sustain its production volumes. Norway is actually approaching its peak production. Um, what else? Azerbaijan, you know, 16 BCM at maximum, it doesn't make huge difference for Europe, where UK decline last year was, I think, 25 BCM. So just to compensate this declining pro indigenous production, it's not enough. Qatar has its moratorium. Iran, I don't think that something will change until 2020. So you see, actually, there are not that much options on the table for Europe, uh, except for Russia. And I promise to show you this graph with the US and East African LNG. Yes, they can export it to Europe, but look at the margins that they can generate in Asia. So obviously they will try to target as much of this LNG to Asia as possible. Um, and then another argument is that, in fact, Gazprom has a huge portfolio of already signed contracts uh, which start to expire only post-2022. And even if we assume that the offtake will be on the level of minimal contractual quantities, of these take or pay volumes, as it was during the last years, uh, even in this case, Russia can foresee quite a stable export volumes to Europe. So why should they worry? Why should they change their strategy? Why should they give, why should they review their pricing mechanism if they have guaranteed market share? And um, anyway, uh, they are not that ugly. And uh, it's just a short list, actually, it's much longer of the contract renegotiations which Gazprom has made already and price discounts which is, it has provided to its customers. But uh, most of these discounts post-2009, uh, they were not already uh, spot <coughs> indexation. Yeah? So they gave some spot indexation in 2009, then they understood that uh, it's uh, 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 creating this uh, stronger desire of the customers to increase this spot component, and they started just to review P0 in the contracts and the coefficients. So all the discounts now are made only in the framework of oil indexed formula. You, you, you have still oil linked contracts, but the price is lower. It's approaching to the uh, spot based prices, which is also growing up on this market, which is getting tighter and tighter. And it looks like next year, uh, you know, last year LNG supplies to Europe, they dropped 25%. Uh, so it's already a very important signal to the market and probably next year it will be even stronger. So actually, uh, if you look at these arguments in favor of oil indexation and in favor of moving to spot indexation, I suppose for Russia, and it's not just Gazprom, I have to stress, it's not Gazprom's strategy, it's strategy of the government. For the government, uh, it is, uh, there is no doubt that they have to protect oil indexation. Now their projects is, uh, they are really expensive. This gas is expensive and just to pay back for it, they need oil indexed prices. And they have this opportunity to press on market, to demand this oil indexation, which was promised to them 
in their contracts. Yeah, don't forget about contract sanctity. So I think that at least until 2016, 2017, Gazprom will be still protecting the soil indexation, maybe giving some price um, discounts to the selected important customers on case-by-case -case basis after very long negotiations, so it will be a complicated process, but not refusing from oil indexation like Gasterra did or Statoil did. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case. Well, and with the Eastern program, as I mentioned, uh, so now there are three main pillars in the Russian uh, gas export strategy. First of them, most important, protect oil indexation. It's critical. It's critical for the Russian budget by the end of the day. Uh, the second one is to develop uh, eastern supplies because there is no room uh, for additional Russian gas in the west, so we have to send it to the east. As I said, it's absolutely unclear how it will be developed. There are very strong uh, discussions, uh, disputes, uh, whether it should be first pipeline to China or first uh, LNG to uh, Japan <coughs> or pipeline to Japan or where this LNG has to be developed. Uh, I suppose that it will take some time before the government will uh, actually um, structure this whole program because it's not just uh, economic question, it's also the question of the balance of power inside Russian oil and gas sector because look, if Rosneft will be allowed to build Sakhalin 1 LNG plant, it will, be it will make huge difference in this system of blocks and checks. Yeah? Uh, and then uh, it is also the question of geopolitics, because whether you send gas first to China or to Japan, it's really very, very sensitive issue, as it was actually with oil, with the ESPO supplies. And then the third pillar is LNG development. It's related to the previous one. And uh, this is a huge number of LNG projects under discussion currently in Russia. Just recently Gazprom has announced this new Baltic LNG, which is mainly targeted for small-scale LNG supplies and bunkering. Uh, so new markets, they are trying to find a new niche uh, to create this new niche in Europe. Uh, this is Yamal LNG, uh, this is the Sakhalin expansion and Vladivostok LNG. Uh, there is an in incredible discussion on LNG export liberalization inside Russia. And uh, all parties, Novatek, Rosneft and Gazprom, are uh, utilizing all their lobbying resources and power in order to get some decision. But there is no decision so far. It's really a very, very sensitive issue. So finally, I think they will get permission on case-by-case -case basis, not the market liberalization, but just exemption for several projects. But uh, it will take time before this uh, situation will uh, get balanced. Well, and these are the conclusions. Resource base is there, it's not a problem at all. Production capacities, they are in place and it's also not a problem. What is a real problem? It is costs, yeah, because we are, not, we are getting not competitive with our incredible production and transportation costs through the new uh, expensive pipelines. And it's also these demand constraints on the export markets. Uh, Europe doesn't seem to be an attractive market anymore, uh, uh, an attractive for, uh, uh, for additional supplies. And so uh, Gazprom with, will simply try to protect its current positions and current pricing, developing at the same time uh, eastern dimension and LNG supplies. Whether it will be successful, we will see, because I would say that during the last five years, situation on the global gas market Market, uh, it changed much more than during the previous 30 years. So this transitional period, it's really difficult and painful, but also very, very interesting. Thank you.